Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with lecturer in sports science at James Cook University, Cal Woods. This episode of the Pacey Performance Podcast is sponsored by Valve Performance, makes of the Nord Board. So if you haven't heard of the Nord Board already, don't worry, I'll explain, it's pretty simple. So the Nord Board is a fast and accurate way to measure hamstring strength. So as you know, practitioners can do very little about athlete age and previous hamstring injury. But what they can do something about is the athlete's strength. So that's where the Nord Board comes into play giving you real-time hamstring strength readings to enhance training, monitoring, and rehabilitation. It isn't going to make your athlete's hamstrings bulletproof, but what it is going to do is give you the right information so you, the practitioner, can make the right decision at the right time. The Nordboard is now available, so if you're interested in finding out a little bit more, you can email info at valveperformance.com or visiting valveperformance.com. The Nord Board is already in use by almost half the Premier League and dozens of other elite teams worldwide. So the Nord Board hamstring testing system is the new standard for high performance sport. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 71 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today I have a lecturer in sports science at James Cook University, Carl Woods. So Carl's research interests are focused around skill acquisition, motor learning and talent ID. So we discuss all of them in the podcast. So it was Carl was recommended to me through Ian McKeo at Port Adelaide uh, in the AFL. So love a recommendation because I know when people put others forward, uh, it means they think highly of them. So it was great to get Carl on. And we have a bit more of a discussion um, later on in the podcast, which hasn't really happened before, I don't think. Um, where I actually give a little bit of a of my opinion, so um, might be able to turn off for that bit. But but it was a great chat with Carl, um, so I'm hoping and I know well I know you will enjoy episode 71. So just before we get into the chat with Carl, just want to quickly mention the Pacey Performance webinar series with Matt Jordan, which is 10 days away. So if you are interested in hearing Matt speak, I know he's got a great article which has just been released um, through Stu McMillan and Derek Everly. So make sure you check that out, the article, um, give a bit of insight into, into Matt's, uh, Matt's thought process and, and the kind of guy Matt is. So it'll be a great webinar. That's on uh, Sunday the 21st of February and that's at 7 p.m. GMT. So if you are interested in getting involved, get over to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Matt. So I hope you enjoy episode 71 and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, hi guys. Thanks for tuning in to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we've got Carl Woods on the phone coming from James Cook University. So just before I get on to the chat with Carl, just want to thank him for his time on a, a Sunday morning for me and a, a Sunday evening for him. So welcome to the podcast, Carl. No, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, really looking forward to it. Pleasure, mate. So just before we get on to the, um, the crux of the chat, do you just want to give people a bit of an introduction on yourself, um, your background and what you're currently doing? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I'm... Uh, currently lecturing in, in sports science, um, uh, specifically in uh, skill acquisition and mode learning at James Cook University in Townsville in Queensland. Um, before that, I was um, living in Perth for a few years where I uh, completed uh, my PhD in more talent ID and, and talent development in, in junior Australian football and, and was lucky enough to um, uh, work concurrently with the Western Australian Football Commission um, which was really handy when you're researching on their athletes. And then um, uh, before that, I, I, I lived in Adelaide um, where uh, I, I um, completed my undergraduate and, and, and honours um, in, uh, in elite Australian footy. So I guess I've kind of just 
um, stayed in, in the football world, but just uh, travelled where I've been able and lucky enough to uh, to jag a job, and I found myself up in Queensland. Cool. So, what's your areas of research at the minute? Um, s- still within that skill acquisition area, okay. but it's still pretty close in there. Yeah, so, uh, primarily, I guess my, my first area of, of immediate interest is, is talent ID um, and, and developing different methodologies um, for, for how we can um, optimize that, that performance or optimize that identification objectively um, uh, for, for sports size and, and, and coaches. Um, so, that, that's first and foremost, but it, it's also um, progressed and, and progressing into um, uh, different elements of performance analytics. Um, in, in team sports, um, so looking for different types of uh, patterns in play uh, to to inform coach um, to to help coaches just design drills and, and, and establish training sessions to optimise uh, performance. Um, and we've started to progress some of the work as well into different types of um, attention focus and, and how that can influence um, uh, motor learning and, and, and skill acquisition. Um, in uh, in different elements of or different actions in, in team sports, so it's 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 diverse, um, but it's still it's I guess umbrellaed, so to speak, in that uh, in that skill acquisition and and, and motor learning um, as sub discipline. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a I have diverse interests in in, in sports science, but um, yeah, I, I, anything talent ID focused and or talent development focused, particularly in, in Australian football, and um, my ears tend to prick up pretty quickly. <laughs> so I mean, we we spoke pretty quite at length uh, beforehand before we press record. In actual fact, I probably could just press record and then we'd have probably been both good to go and get on with our Sunday. But um, just with regards to the talent ID process at the minute for for coaches, um, wanting obviously wanting to push players into the AFL, what what's that what's mm-hmm. that current process look like? Yeah, so I guess it it, it um, very generically uh, each uh, state there's a, a state academy program uh, in, in Australia. So within that state academy program, you've got two levels. You've got an under sixteen level and an under eighteen level. So um, within those levels, uh, um, there's there's separate talent ID uh, processes that go on. Uh, so, um, taking Western Australia, for example, um, out of all the Western Australian Football League uh, teams, there's there's junior teams in there as well at the under-16 and under-18 level, and then all of those under-16 players and all of those under-18 players really strive for 30 to 40, or in some some cases, 50 places uh, onto, onto the under-16 um, uh, academy and the under-18 academy. So, what coaches usually do um, is, is, I guess, they... It's hard for them to detract uh, subjective uh, opinions and, and bias, so that they, they tend to rely quite heavily on watching players play the game uh, from the subsequent year or the previous year, um, and, uh, and and have already made their decisions somewhat before um, the actual talent ID process goes on. But they do generally have uh, a, a talent weekends and testing sessions where all um, listed under sixteen and um, under eighteen players. Uh, are tested anthropometrically. Um, in some cases, they go through some technical skill assessments as well. And we've, we've tried to integrate, at least in WA, some, some perceptual skill measures as well uh, to provide a little bit more uh, of, of, a, of a comprehensive approach to the talent ID process uh, rather than just relying on um, fairly superficial physical and anthropometric markers uh, that, that, that coaches would traditionally use in that kind of combine um, uh, approach. Um, and then from that, once they get uh, ID'd onto the, the program, they then get exposed to um, a, a really opportunistic environment where they're provided with superior uh, uh, coaching and, and very intensive coaching, not just specific to football, but also um, they're, they're provided with, with um, uh, a fairly high calibre of sports science um, intervention and medical intervention, and, and in some cases as well, um, uh, some player work. Their services to uh, to really support their their development um, and their their growth as, as a footballer. Um, so once they're a part of that program, they they then at the under eighteen level are exposed to um, a, a bit of a training phase, and then they go into a national championship competition where they'll they'll play against other staff. Eight academy representatives at that under 18 level um, in in um, uh, all the, the different states uh, in Australia in a, in a six to uh, to a four to six week competition, 
um, where they get uh, um, uh, viewed from uh, AFL talent recruiters that, that go to, to watch these games to try to um, identify who they want to draft uh, into their uh, into their AFL team, um, and uh, if they have a de decent enough championships, um, the the under 18s at least, they might get an invitation to the national combine at the end of the year, uh, where about a hundred odd um, under 18s are, are, um, are invited to go on and participate on or participate within, um, and that's when clubs get the opportunity to to perhaps interview players a little bit more intently to see how they might go in different types of pressured environments and um, uh, kind of gauge what what person they are and, and, and what their interests and what makes them tick and, and all of the above and um, then they make their decisions and and hopefully come draft time the uh, the players hear their names called um, and uh, they make their way to any AFL club that uh, was willing to draft them. So it's it's a lengthy -ish process that I guess initiates somewhat at, a, at an under 16 level. So yeah, fifteen-year-olds. That's usually the age in which they they start to really decide that this is this is something I want to really shoot for, and 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 that's when they they um, um, go pretty hard at it at around that age. But uh, yeah, it's a, can in some cases be a, a three to four year uh, process to try to get into into the AFL. So so what commonalities are there the, for the ones that that pro end up progressing to the AFL when you yeah. obviously tested them at sixteen, eighteen? Yeah, it's 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 a tough one. Um, I guess that that under eighteen into the AFL is is a, a little bit harder to model somewhat. Um, I guess because AFL clubs uh, tend to draft athletes based upon weaknesses or perceived weaknesses that they have at their team. So if a side is missing a key defender, they're going to go look for a key defender uh, or the best available key defender. So the attributes of that key defender might be quite different from the other midfielder that got drafted as well or, or the forward that got drafted. So at that, that at, um, under 18 into the, the AFL drafting process, it's somewhat hard, but I guess we've looked um, uh, from a gameplay perspective. So we've, we've kind of mined into their G and, and they um, accrue these champion data statistics as well. So real game specific notations um, to see the difference between drafted and non-drafted players in terms of their game style involvement. And what we found is that very generically players that are drafted into the AFL tend to accrue uh, a high number of inside 50. So they, they deliver the ball into the attacking 50 meter arc more often than uh, um, uh, players not drafted and, and they can accrue a greater number of contested possessions as well. So they're pretty good at going into a pack and grabbing their own footy and then running away with it uh, as well. So that, that's basically telling us that clubs really are interested in, in, in tough players that can, you know, uh, that don't and shy away from um, uh, a, a bit of body contact uh, that can go in and, and get their own ball, but also then um, be fairly skillful with it. Uh, so whether that be running the ball into their forward 50 or kicking, delivering it by foot uh, into the into the forward 50 arc as well to obviously try to, to score. So, I mean, that's from a game perspective. Uh, we have done some, uh, well, we, we've done some work uh, looking at um, uh, physical attributes of, of drafted and non-drafted players as well. Um, what, what we've seen is sprint time and, and maximal aerobic capacity seem to be a pretty um, um, pertinent factor of, of kids getting drafted into the AFL uh, or not getting drafted into the AFL at under 16 level. So there are some generic um, uh, attributes that, uh, that, that seem to be uh, somewhat consistent, but I guess what we find uh, is that, that clubs tend to really look to isolate what they need or what they perceive they need on their list and then um, uh, go and, and search for that athlete and, and hope that they find it. Um, so I guess we see more of the consistencies at the uh, talent ID process at the under 18 level. So kids that get selected onto the academy or kids that don't get selected onto the academy. We're, we're pretty happy to know that kids that are selected onto the academy program um, uh, have a greater aerobic capacity um, and can produce some pretty impressive jumps uh, in terms of running dynamic jump uh, heights as well. Um, they tend to have a, a broader skill set and, and a more astute skill in terms of kicking skill and handballing skill um, and their perceptions in terms of their decision making capabilities as well are, are far more advanced than the players not selected um, uh, onto the academy. So I guess very generally, it's kind of telling us that they're just better footy players um, in terms of our, our assessments anyway. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you, I mean, you mentioned perceptual skills um, that you integrated yeah. into, the, into the system. How are you, what did that look like? What does that yeah, assessment so we, look like? We, 
Yeah, we developed a um, 20 minute um, uh, video based decision making task. So very briefly, players will watch a passage of play up on the screen uh, for about 15 to 20 seconds so they can kind of get that, that feel of, of being in, in, in the game or at least understanding the, the passage of play. Um, and then at the critical decision making moment um, where the, the player in possession of the ball has to make a decision as to where they would or who they would dispose the ball to, the uh, the person viewing the footage would then obviously have to decide who they would pass the ball to in that in that situation based upon environmental constraints that they're watching um, on, uh, on on the film or that they just watched on the film so they would record their decision down or, or isolate where they pass the ball to or who they pass the ball to and then uh, and then then we progress on so usually those those clips um, had anywhere from three to five potential decision making options that they could they could uh, dispose the ball to. And the correct decision um, was was provided or was defined um, uh, to us by an expert panel of coaches that viewed a large battery of, of clips, um, uh, fifty odd clips from memory, uh, and then uh, the ones in which they all independently agreed upon uh, were the clips in that, that we obviously included into the final edit of the task, uh, and, and and have um, then gone about researching with it. So. So it's it's um, that particular task has has been integrated back into that the talent ID process in in WA and it's something that we we'd like to envisage start we'd start to progress into other state academy programs as well um, but that that kind of decision making task is purely from an offensive perspective so the player in possession of the ball and the other really important element of, of decision making in the game is. Is when you don't have, I think many many people actually have all and then trying to get it back from the opposition. So we we've started to progress a little bit further to, to look at um, defensive decision making skill using a similar methodology. It's just a, a much harder process to to do to, to isolate decisions when players should look to chop out to to impede or intercept the ball or if they should stay with their immediate opponent. Um, so it's they're, they're typically harder clips to find during game play. So we're, we're perhaps thinking that um, uh, some kind of setup scenario might be the way to go to test such a skill, or, or at least constrain the environment in, in a small sided game rather than uh, filming actual game play. Um, uh, we, we tend to set up a small sided game and film that and isolate defensive situations where players need to, to act to, to win the footy back, to intercept the footy. So um, rather interesting, that's the, the um, uh, perceptual, that decision making element is probably the, the most pertinent in terms of discriminating between talent ID and non talent ID out of a uh, range of phys uh, physical and anthropometric assessments and, uh, and technical skill based assessments as well. So uh, it's definitely telling us that we need to invest a bit more time in terms of research uh, focus in that area. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, with regards to um, kind of movement competency, what are you yep. finding in? In the under 16s, especially the, the, from my point of view, the interesting bit is the lower end of the um, low age groups. What are you finding ac across the board with regards to their, the quality of their, their movement and how that is kind of impacting on their potential progression? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. It's I, it's a, it's a pretty hot topic, I guess, at the moment. It's um, something that. Uh, we've, we've spent a bit of time looking into at the U18 level, but now we've, we've progressed backwards, I guess, as well to see what, what's going on. And it's a bit scary in that um, the U16s that we're, we've tested don't seem to be any better or any worse than, as I should probably say, any worse than the under 18s. So although the under 18s have been in that environment for a couple of years longer, um, in that, that elite environment, they haven't really developed uh, their, their their movement competencies. So when we look at it, an AFL environment, um, the the younger younger level or the, the early um, uh, the rookies, so to speak, on that list, the jump between the rookies and then the the uh, next level up, next tier up of of, of players is is quite dramatic, um, and we're not seeing that change at the under sixteen to the under eighteen level. So it's probably telling us that the the actual um, development of the guys, although it might be occurring. Um, through game specific uh, 
um, skills, so kicking and handballing and, and so on and so forth. But we're not actually seeing much of a, a, an improvement in their, their movement competency or their, their movement skill um, in, a, in a pretty specific um, battery of, of, of movements. Uh, so from our perspective, from um, the, the, the sports size, what we've then done or what we've implemented, some really basic, simple things that I think the vast majority of people would be doing anyway, but um, we've just integrated broomsticks into our warm-ups. So um, uh, a lot of the boys now are doing uh, the key movement and performing the key movement patterns that we need that in time-constrained situations that we can't really, um, you know, when we've got, we're dealing with under six, 16 kids that are, you know, battling through school and um, social life and all of the above that we, we only really get them three to four times a week, four times a week maximally. Um, and obviously the footy coaches have a fair say at what they do and, and they tend to focus more on, on the, the skill side of things. So we've just tried to optimise our time and, and, and integrated broomsticks into their warm-ups, um, things like overhead squats, uh, single leg RDLs, um, lunges, um, very basic um, motor patterns. Uh, that we can train to to almost kill two birds with one stone and um, get them warming up, but also train some, some movements. And that's it's a bit of an idea that um, uh, Ian McKeown from Port Power started um, during his PhD in junior basketball um, to integrate some um, um, movement patterns in their warm up as a bit of a dynamic warm up, but also as a training intervention as well. And, and we've, what we've seen through that is some, some pretty impressive results in terms of. Um, power output and, and injury reduction in in, uh, in in certain industries. So, yeah, very simplistic things, but we can have some some pretty um, impressive um, transference uh, if on the field and, and in their movement patterns. But yeah, I, I guess that's that's from an Australian footy perspective. I mean, um, I, I'm not too sure elsewhere. I, we've, we've looked at some soccer guys, and, and they seem to be it seems to be telling a pretty similar story at the under 18 level. Um, in in talent ID soccer players as well, but I, I, I'm pretty, I'd be pretty interested to see elsewhere. I mean, I guess in your experience, what 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 have you come across with some of the junior guys uh, in terms of their movement competencies? Um, from my work at at Doncaster, um, I think I was reasonably well. I was reasonably uh, early in my kind of S and C career, but the, that was probably three or four years ago now. But um, thinking back, it was it was something that I would definitely focus more of my time on. And I think I was kind of pretty dictated a lot by by coach at the time and maybe didn't feel like I had the, the kind of power to implement the things that I felt were the right thing to do. Um, but, think, but looking back now, it was... Um, some of the things that we used to see on the pitch uh, during warm-ups and things like that, there was so much room for for improvement given given the mm -hmm. time. I mean, I used to have. I mean, you're talking about maximum four times a week as an as the SNC coach looking after the under twelves, for instance. I my total time was uh, thirty five minutes across the week. Wow, well, that, that was my time with the with the guys. I mean, it was yeah. a category category three uh, football club. Yeah. So I'm sure the category, the, the kind of higher cat, cat, uh, teams had a little bit more time. I'm hoping they had a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, mine was split into two blocks of pretty much 20 minutes, uh, as well mm. as uh, the warm-up on them two nights, which was pretty mm. maximum 10 minutes before the, the coaches are tapping the, tapping the watch to get them get the balls out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, time was just so limited. It was it was untrue. So to get actual inequality with, I mean, as as you, I'm sure you're aware, with a you know you get the um, under twelves in the gym, it takes them what five minutes to actually change the shoe from the boots to the shoes, yeah. stop, yeah. you know, hitting each other and pulling each other's shorts down and things like that. So yeah. forty minutes quickly disappears. So but yeah, there was so much Maybe it's something. improvement in soccer football. Yeah, and maybe maybe it's something that I, I, I built into coach education. So, you know, I, I think sometimes some of the problems um, with this, you know, thirty five minutes over over a week is, you know, at that at that critical age, it's just not, in my opinion, it's just not good enough. Um, and there's only obviously, as you said, only so much you can do. So you you really focus on the, the big money making 
and things that you can try to improve, but um, you, you tend to um, at the you do that at the expense of other things that you know are of equal importance. So I think maybe in those um, you know coach uh, accreditation courses, there, there needs to be a, a real emphasis on some of these things, not just on how to be a better coach and you know signs to look for in in in, in players that are perhaps dropping form and all of these extra things. Maybe there needs to be. Um, an extra module in there on on some kind of physical development um, beyond the pitch or beyond the field, uh, and these these types of things need to be structurally allocated. Because I found that um, the co the best coaches that I've worked with um, over the last couple of years are the, are the ones that are very uh, supportive of um, of this kind of understanding you know it, it was it's pretty hard to to get broomsticks out of training and, and get coaches to, to <laughs> integrate and, and embrace that when they're kind of watching the players with these broomsticks doing these really peculiar things that they or they think are peculiar things out on, on, the, on the field so um, maybe it's something that we need to integrate or that s structures and organizations need to integrate into um, coach education and, and coach accreditation panels and and all of those those things, not just at that senior level, but back at that you know um, real grassroots junior level, so they have an, an appreciation for it at least, um, and to, to try to integrate it into the program, because um, that's where I tend to run into roadblocks. It's it's um, it's coaches simply just not understanding it, uh, not understanding that the benefits of it, and maybe then the onus falls back on on me or or, or the sports scientist to really. Get the coach to understand why why we're doing it and, and why we need to do it, which is kind of then I guess where my real interest in, in research started was how can I get these guys to to understand that we need to do these things and that we need to in, integrate this as, as regular practice. Well, the only you know I can say it, but I mean I'm I'm a kid in comparison to the you know the 40 year veteran coach, um, but maybe if I actually have some data and some some um, reference there that they can draw upon. Um, or that they can look at um, and at least acknowledge that kind of will go a, a fair way to uh, to try and change culture and, and change practice. Um, but I think as well, some of it stems back from you know the, the big senior clubs, the, the elite clubs, um, the AFL clubs, and my in you know my area of research turning around and actually then saying, yeah, this is what we need, this is what we want, um, and then that that tends to have a fair bit of pull. And I think they're doing that. You know, the, the clubs consistently say that the, the kids that they're drafting just are nowhere near the standard that they need to be at, and so now the the kind of emphasis of research is is shifting from. Right, um, not not an acute strategy once they're in the game at that, that elite level, but more of a, a long term. What can we do at those junior levels to to really enhance the development of, of our kids, so that once they get into the AFL environment, they're there for a, a prolonged period of time, or at least able to partake in the vast majority of training sessions, and, and hopefully don't break down in the first year or the first six months of being at the uh, being at the footy club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's kind of getting a bit of traction over here. Um, just for, for a number of reasons that I probably won't say, but uh, is a guy called Luke Jenkinson at Sheffield United uh, Academy. And he's putting a lot of kind of info out and, and videos out and things like that on, on social media, showing his younger age groups. I think he looks after nines to 16s, uh, mm -hmm. um, category two, I think, academy, uh, who've been really, really successful over the last couple of years in getting people through the academy to the first team and uh, approaching it in a in a more multi-sports way and getting the kids doing assault courses, boxing, athletics, uh, they're building a, a horizontal uh, climbing wall down at the academy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's getting a lot of traction and I, I was kind of speaking to him and, and another guy um, texted me saying, oh, it's um, that, that, that's always been around. I'm like, mm -hmm. it has always been around, but can you tell me how many people are doing it in academies? And he was like, uh, yeah, all right. And I think everyone knows it's the right thing to do, but the having the balls and the support and Luke's got the support at Sheffield United, hundred percent. But yeah. having the, the the support from the coaches it is another thing. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I'm a massive fan of that, particularly that age groups. Uh, those those age groups. I mean, that's looking at all the developmental models of expertise. Um, we should really be promoting a, a, a kind of diversity at those younger ages because they can engage in such vast gross motor skill development that the transference of those motor skills into a range of other domains. I mean, 
uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of, of, of kind of getting them as involved in as many sports as possible and until as, as late as possible. And then when they have to kind of specialise at that 15, 16 years of age. But yeah, at that young, young level massively. And I, I think you're right. I mean, um, it, it's it's kind of always been there, but it's it seemed to have taken a bit of a back seat. You don't see it that much, particularly in Australia anymore. You, you don't see those there's real um, uh, that, that real diversity, uh, particularly in you know like gymnastics or, or um, those those kinds of um, athletic uh, actions or activities that, that really promote that gross motor development and awareness uh, that these players come through. Because I mean, I, I, it's almost a bit concerning that are we producing um, are we are we producing athletes or are we producing footy players? And, and if we're producing footy players, that's almost a bit concerning that we're, we're just producing athlete that can only do one thing uh, or a player that can only do one thing. You'd, you'd like to think that, um, you know, you, you're producing, uh, developing athletes first and foremost, um, talking explicitly physically, obviously, and, um, and then they're, they're obviously produced uh, into into footy players. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty scary to think that um, there would be kids that have never – um, you know, that, that have never been exposed to those kinds of um, gross motor development environments. But uh, integrating them into an academy, oh, yeah, it's a great idea, great idea. But like you said, um, you know, getting buy-in from a coach um, to, to, to do that, and I guess as well the other, the other pertinent uh, piece of the puzzle is the parents, getting the parents to actually see the, the importance of some of this stuff. You know, they, their kid goes to footy training and they're, they're – you know, playing with hula hoops, the parents probably think, "What the hell are they doing?" Um, but, but kind of understanding why they're doing it uh, and, the, and the benefit that they can get, you know, very left field. But I, I've thought of the idea as well of, um, uh, you know, in, in certain pre-season or phases of the pre-season, taking the players away and, and playing basketball. You know, now not just uh, for a bit of fun because I mean, who doesn't like? A bit of NBA action, but it, not not just from that, but also um, uh, some some of Jason Berry's work in in mid two thousands has, has showed that uh, some of the participation in those those kinds of sports transfers uh, perceptual skill um, into Australian footy as well. So you're not just um, uh, exposing them to a slightly different motor pattern uh, to try to train uh, flexible motor patterns. It's more. Um, perceptual elements that can transfer into those sports too. So um, maybe a, a real diversity at those uh, in in those younger younger years is, is definitely something that's perhaps um, abandoned more often than it should be, um, or not integrated as as well as it should be at that at those levels. I mean, was that something that you put in, or that you tried to in? I mean, in thirty five minutes a week is pretty hard. Yeah. Um, but it is something that. At that, at that age, at under 12, did you find that your guys were playing a range of different sports or was it more just really unidimensional? Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure of the club's policy on the, the, the lads kind of uh, been allowed to play other sports. I think there was mm. a re – they tried. I, I can pretty much hand on heart say that the, the club tried to stop the lads – playing kind of school football um as yep. they as they got older um and as the as kind of regulation came in more and more hours were required for the lads to be in uh in, in the club but yep. i i'd be very surprised not that i know this for sure but i'd be very surprised if the under 12s 13s and 14s were playing basketball as well or yep. rugby as well because I don't, in all honesty i don't think there's enough time for them to play anything else um, maybe yeah. you know three three evenings a week, uh, a Saturday morning, and games on a Sunday. Like I just don't think there was that opportunity to be able to do that. And I don't think, thinking back now, I probably wasn't willing to take the feeling like I wasn't willing to take the hit on my time to integrate a basketball, you know, a basketball game. Or yeah, right, yeah, thinking back now, I probably should have done. And and said, you know, we're, we're going to have a, you know, we're going to go to a gymnastics club or we're going to go to an athletics track and we're going to do something different. Um, but given the time again, I 100% would. I think it's something as well that you, you, we, we tend to, I've massively been um, uh, fallen in this trap as well that, 
at the end of the day, in these academy programs, we're dealing, you're dealing with kids, you know, you're dealing with under 12s, under 14s, under 16s and, and under 18s and well, to a lesser extent at that under 18 level, but definitely at those younger younger levels, I mean, they're, they're, they're still, they just love the game and they're, they're playing for the love of the game and, and I, I guess we can't, you, you, you can never take that for granted um, uh, from a uh, developmental perspective as well. That that's why they're participating in this sport first and foremost, and I guess keeping them keeping it as fun of an environment as possible for them um, really keeps them engaged in, in that, and, and perhaps integrating some of those slightly different, slightly diverse practices at that that, that in that during that talent pathway really just reminds them that it is still a, a bit of fun. And the way that I try to say it, it um, uh, in, in different coaching courses is it's almost like the parent trying to um, hide the uh, the greens in, in a kid's dinner, in their children's <laughs> dinner, you know, by integrating into a spaghetti bolognese or something. It's a similar kind of thing. So, so trying to integrate um, um, certain practices that they don't really see as, as, the, as, a, as a really learned practice uh, at, at that younger level. Um, so I'm, I'm happy from a, a, a physical development standpoint, the player's fun or having fun, they're enjoying it. And the coaches are happy because obviously they're, they're, they're doing something specific to their sport. So um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, quite often we, we get um, persuaded by just trying to really create the, the utmost professional as quickly as possible, but you yeah. tend to lose sight that they're still kids. Yeah, and they're still doing it for a bit of fun and, and they want to have fun um, and you don't want them to burn out first and foremost, you want them to, to stay around. I hate to think, absolutely hate to think of the talent that's fallen through the cracks, um, that they've just lost uh, interest in the game because they've been exposed to inadequate training uh, environments or, or, or they've been um, subjected to an overtrained environment. Um, uh, or they just haven't enjoyed the real um, mechanistic structures implemented at, a, at a, the wrong stage of development. Uh, I'd, I'd really hate to think of the, the waste of talent that's potentially been, not just in, in Australian footy, but in a range of different sports. Mm. I mean, one thing that that was just a kind of a couple of throwaway comments when we first started chatting um, off air was, was regards to the weather, especially over yeah. here. I mean, I was just saying that there's a strange yellow thing in the sky for the first time in four, in four or five months that we you know we haven't seen i mean i was at a, a reasonably kind of club with a very tight budget you know we yeah. had a, a small size astroturf which was probably um i don't know 40 by 30 and then an in, a gym inside obviously indoor gym that was pretty much it so there was yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna do that kind of thing just take the you know game of basketball for example yeah yeah. We'd have had to hire a, an indoor court, which would have yeah. cost money. Who's going to foot that bill? Would it be parents? Well, it's reasonably, reasonably deprived area, so that would probably not go down very well. Are the club going to foot that bill? Uh, well, I struggled to get five pounds for a, a couple of mini bands, so maybe not. Yeah. But we had the, you know, we've already got this astro turf here, so you're going to make the most of it. Yeah, but it's, it's. I've got, I've got them the twelves, and it's minus five outside, so. You know, I'm gonna rather go in the gym, to be honest. Yeah, and that, they're, they're the, the the logistical and financial constraints that um, are, are really that really do dictate what you can do and, yeah. and the, the kind of leniency that you have a lot of the time um, with, with these academy programs. One thing um, for for you know people in similar positions that, that might be listening in, um, one thing that I found worked quite well uh, was is it. it Try to get the program as embedded as possible with a university. Um, so uh, we, we embedded quite early on um, Edith Cowan University in Perth with the Western Australian Football Commission um, to try to facilitate large testing sessions and, and an internship program. And that way, um, both sides of the, the, the kind of Fence are, are, uh, are pretty happy. You know, the, the, the footy players, uh, we were fortunate enough to use uh, the facilities at the university for testing and training um, procedures when we couldn't go elsewhere. So we were fortunate enough to, to use uh, the strength lab in, in, in particular phases of the season and, and test on a range of different court structures. And, and the university was then also able to provide us with, uh, with intern, uh, interns that, that we could, could then get their prac hours. Now, from our perspective, that's great because you know, our budget was, you know, 
non-existent. I guess the vast majority of the time our coaches were probably losing money being there because um, they, they obviously couldn't be in their, their usual day job. So for us getting interns in that environment as well provided such support um, uh, to, for, for game days, for training sessions. Um, I know that the physios enjoyed it quite a lot because a lot of the time they got um, stuck on water duty um, and, and um, that got quite troublesome when players um, uh, needed physio assistance. So, you know, embedding, embedding a program into a university um, uh, is just was such a lifesaver for us. And they've continued that process now going through as well. So there's uh, a couple of interns that go through that that, that system as well um, uh, each uh, each year, but um, the the financial constraint is something that uh, for yeah we were faced with yearly, you know, it, it, to the to the point of, in which that you know the, the number of players that we were able to include into our academy program was obviously financially constrained. So some years it would be. You know, mid forties. Other years it would be low forties. Other years it would be high thirties. Um, so it was it was it was really dictated to us. And then it was a matter of, all right, what what can we do? Um, um, how can we optimize these guys with, with the money that, that, that we have? And uh, a lot of the time we yeah either had to rely on incline support or um, um, really uh, just we were fortunate to have some absolutely fantastic people in 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 the program that were really willing to go above and beyond what they were. Um, called to do um, to to provide as best of an environment as possible for our for our junior footy players, and that's that's a similar trend in in state academy programs across the country from an AFL perspective or Australian footy perspective. Anyway, that just have such great people at that level that are really doing it for the love of of seeing juniors develop. Um, they're willing to kind of um, put themselves in 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 those kinds of awkward logistical positions to to really try to provide these these kids with the best environment that we can. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that that's probably an issue that is going to be around for a, yeah quite a while and, until you know funding sits backwards um, at, at to that, that that grassroots level, so we can you know use it to employ. Um, um, highly skilled people in those positions or, or we can use it to, to provide uh, athletes with the best possible learning environment that, uh, that, that, that can be exposed to them at that, that level. But you're right, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, you can't expect the parents to pay, you definitely can't expect the kids to pay, uh, particularly at the younger levels yeah. and, um, and then you're, you're kind of just really hoping that you can jag some in-kind support from some people or, or really try to embed yourself in a university structure as quickly and, and comprehensively as you can. Uh, it's, you know, where I am now, that's, that's you know, what we, we try to do quite well with a lot of the sporting teams up here, up north. Um, yeah, we, we do a lot of testing for the Cowboys, uh, the NRL team up here. We, we do quite a bit of work. We've got one of our staff members up here is um, uh, currently working with the, uh, the the Townsville Crocs, which are the NBL side up here. We sponsor the, the Fire, which is the female basketball side up here as well. So um, uh, these these clubs get a you know we, we try to provide as, as all of our facilities for them um, to 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 provide them with a bit of a uh, opportunistic environment as well. But um, yeah, it's that that relationship. I think university and sporting organisations is something that that can't be um, um, overemphasized. I think it's it's pretty important at a uh, range of developmental at the elite and at the junior levels. No, absolutely. I think looking back now, I think you can get. I don't, Although I think money is uh, a big issue, I think you can get very creative and do it for yeah. on a shoestring budget. And I don't think it should be, oh, you know, I can't get $15 or £15 pounds from the coach, so it isn't going to happen. We're just going to carry on doing what we've always done. I think you can get quite creative and using Luke as another example at Sheffield United has got really creative with not a lot of money. Um, yeah. So I don't think it should be a, a complete, you know, barrier to... No, to, to moving forward and doing what you think's right, but yeah, not at all. I mean, um, and, and and it's 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 a matter of I guess coming up with a needs analysis as well, developing a needs analysis, and we we, we if you if you have a little bit of a budget where that is going to be best optimized and or, or, or best spent, but um, uh, yeah, you know, if you, you can't primarily let uh, a lack of funding dictate uh, what you, you you can and can't do, it's a matter I guess of trying to think outside. The boxes 
uh, as best you can um, uh, with the with the cards you're dealt. Uh, I know that the guys in um, uh, in, in WA, um, Harry Banyard and, and a couple of the other guys that are over there at the moment that are they're really um, doing as, as innovative things as they can possibly do with you know three bucks. So um, it's, it's yeah, it, it's as best as your uh, imagination can take you with some of the things um, yeah, at that at that young level, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Just one thing that I want to uh, speak to you a little bit about, Carl, is the uh, just before I let you go, is the yeah. kind of delving into the data and really using data to um, to inform your kind of practicing talent ID, but as you know, yeah. actually integrating that within um, coaching sessions and training sessions. Do you just want to talk yeah. to a little bit about how you kind of use that data? Yeah, a um, couple of different ways, I guess. Um, uh, we, from a, a research perspective, I guess, when you're dealing with um, uh, a huge, huge pool of variables, you know, some of these uh, uh, bits of microtechnology that you can have provide vast amounts of, 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 of data. I guess what when you're dealing with that, you, you want to know what what is really pertinent to look at and probably no one in the country is doing it better at the moment than, than Sam Robertson and the guys at, at VU and the Western Bulldogs. Um, some of the, the analytics that they're, they're developing are really um, groundbreaking stuff to try to pull out some of the more meaningful variables that you've got. Um, um, I know from a what, what we do quite intently from a talent ID perspective uh, is, is try to use numbers to, to remove coach subjectivity and bias, you know, um, and, and almost then provide justification as to why these kids weren't selected, but these kids were selected. Um, so it's, it's a real um, opportunity for coaches to have some uh, justification for their their all the talent scouts justification for their picks but at the same time either to reinforce what they're seeing as well so if, if, if the coach thinks that you know player x is, is, is seems to be making the, the right decisions a lot of the time and and you know their, their scores from some of our perceptual tasks reinforce that well that, that's that's obviously great conversely if, if the coach perhaps doesn't think that that player is making the right decisions but our tasks perhaps provide some contrary results then we'd have a, a really uh, robust discussion about why or why they why they should or shouldn't be uh, be selected um, uh, really importantly we I think uh, data can be used um, to enhance training specificity um, so to give you a bit of an example we, we've got a, um, a, a postgraduate student at the moment in, in Perth um, who's looking into um, uh, that exact question. So what uh, what we're doing in training sessions or what they're doing in training sessions um, to see if it's actually um, stimulating what's happening in a game. Now, uh, uh, if it isn't, um, then we look at strategies of enhancing drill design to make sure that our drills uh, are indeed in enforcing or, or training the qualities that they're doing in a game. Um, if they're not, then we can't really expect players to, we, or we can't um, uh, you know, punish players for making wrong decisions out on the field if our training sessions aren't actually uh, facilitating that. So that, that's through a range of different strategies. Yes, using GPS analytics to look from, from a physical perspective to make sure that they're, they're running intensities and that they're, they're running velocities are indeed um, similar to, to gameplay, but also um, delving a little bit further into to, to some of the um, uh, technical notations that players would, would um, encounter during a training session to make sure that if at the very basic level, if a player gets 10 kicks uh, in a game to make sure that they're getting, you know, 10 kicks minimum in, in training or during training um, to, to make sure that we're, we're stimulating or providing a stimulating environment to, to enhance the specificity of training and, and in some cases just really uh, overstimulate training sessions to get a bit of an overloading um, uh, effect in, uh, in training to transfer into games as well. Um, so we're, we're looking, we're looking to take that um, perceptually, so to look at the, the types of um, uh, decisions that, that players are making during training sessions to make sure that they are um, uh, being replicated in a game, um, not just uh, when they're in possession of the ball, but also when they're not in possession of the ball um, as well. So that that's, I, I think it's, it's an area that, that can always be improved, uh, understanding data and understanding how to use data and model data in the most effective way. I mean, no coach wants to sit down and, you know, understand the, the algorithm or the fitting algorithm 
them behind a decision tree, but what, what they do want to know is, is perhaps um, what, what the decision tree is actually telling them to inform how they should design their training sessions or design their training drills. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's an area that, that performance analytics is, is an area that um, uh, can be improved and it's, it's something that we're trying to integrate um, up here at, at James Cook into our undergraduate sports science program. We're looking to try to integrate a performance analytics course uh, or module up here for our students, but I know they're, they're, they're looking to do that in a few other universities as well because we find that a few of our graduates tend to go into those, those you know, in, in, when they first get their foot in the door at a sporting team, I guess their first job is um, stuck behind a camera or stuck behind a computer looking at GPS numbers. So we, we kind of want to provide them with the uh, the skill sets to actually um, uh, provide coaches with, with real important and meaningful data that, that can be used to complement um, uh, coaching interventions and, and drills and drill designs. Cool. Yeah. No, it's really interesting, all of it, mate. So um, I'm just cautious of time. I know we, we've been on the phone for an hour and a half, but um, I don't want to yeah. completely take over your uh, take over your Sunday, which I think I have done already. If I'm honest with you. Nah, that, but, that's okay. It, but, it's, um, uh, not much, to, not much to do in Townsville on a Sunday <laughs> night, so uh, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Cool. Well, where can uh, where can people find out what you've got going on? Uh, Twitter? You on Twitter? Yeah, yeah. Twitter's probably the best uh, best port of call. Um, Twitter, or, or or if they're interested. Uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, latest research, ResearchGate um, uh, as well. It's where they can they can track me down. But I tend to be pretty uh, pretty active on Twitter. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I tend to put stuff that we've um, we've done up as soon as possible. So do you need a Twitter handle, Carl? You know it. Uh, Carl Woods twenty five. Nice, cool. Well, thank you for that. It was uh, it was no. great, and I'll um, I'll put all the. All the all the links that you've um, you've provided on the site, so people can uh, people can check them out. No, thank you very much. No, any opportunity to to, uh, to chat um, about sports science or, or talent development, very much. I, I just think there's such areas that, that can be improved and, and consistently uh, investigated in. So um, yeah, yeah. I hope you can take something from it uh, from some of the jargon that I was talking about. <laughs> no, absolutely, mate. But I'll. Um, We'll, we'll we'll keep in touch, and I'll uh, I'll let I'll be in touch over the next week or two. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds right. good. No worries at all. All right, pal. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks. Take See it you, easy. Mate. Bye, mate. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode seventy one of the Pacey Performance Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the chat with Carl. So just before I let you go, just want to make sure that you're aware of the Pacey Performance Webinar Series Number Three with Matt Jordan. So that's on the 21st of February and it's at 7 p.m. GMT. So Matt will discuss everything from monitoring uh, and detecting fatigue and asymmetries. So it'd be a great uh, webinar with Matt. So if you are interested in finding out a little bit more, get over to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Matt. So again, hope you enjoyed episode 71 and I will speak to you in episode 72.